Okay, welcome to the last session of this workshop. Uh, I'm Soyoung Ha from MCube. Uh, I'm a chair uh, in this uh, session four on hazard prediction by a couple modeling. Uh, this is a short uh, session with just two speakers here. And our first speaker is Rajesh Kumar. Uh, he's gonna talk about advancing air quality predictions in New Delhi uh, during the crop residue warning season. Uh, take it away, Rajesh. Thanks, Soyang. Can you hear me? Yeah. And looks good. So do you see the two yeah. panes or the full screen? Yeah. Okay. okay. So yeah, um, I'm going to talk about uh, the air quality forecasting system that we have developed uh, in for New Delhi, uh, together with the Ministry of Earth Sciences institutions in India, namely uh, Indian Institute of Tropical Meteorology and India Meteorological Department. And so this was a three-year project that just ended in December last year, but we are still um, still collaborating in this system and, uh, and and writing more proposals to further advance this system. The image that you see in the background, it's a image of one of the polluted days in Delhi. So in the background, you see the Kanat place, which is the business center for Delhi. And this is sometime during the daytime. So you can see that uh, the, there is, you can't even see so you can't even differentiate whether it's evening or daytime. But so these are the type of pollution events that's inspired the development of this system. So um, the brief outline is that I'll give a brief overview of air quality problem in Delhi, uh, and then two phases of the air quality early warning system development uh, that we have done together with the Indian Institute. And finally, the summary. So for those who do not know where Delhi is, uh, it's in Northern India. So this is where Delhi is. And it is um, to the Northwest. And in fact, uh, to also the, to the Northeast, this is the Himalayan range, which is where we have mountains going as tall as four kilometer and, and higher. And to the South, we have the Deccan Plateau. So Delhi is really located in this valley. And this is called Indogangetic Plain. Uh, this is only the Indian part. There is also the uh, part of IGP that covers Pakistan. So during the winter time, what happens is that the boundary layer is really shallow. It's not able to rise even above these uh, Deccan Plateau. And all the emissions uh, that are uh, occurring in this region, they get trapped within that shallow boundary layer. So the boundary layer, uh, so the air quality problem is the most severe during uh, winter time. Here on the right, this is a map of Delhi uh, along with the population density. And you can see that the population density in some parts of the Delhi exceeds almost 65,000 people per person per kilometer square. In the middle of, or not on the middle, on the east side of Delhi, we have the Yamuna River. So the population density is highest uh, towards the east of the Yamuna River. And uh, we also have several pockets of very high population density um, on the west part. So anthropogenic emissions, they are major so emission sources affecting Delhi and that occurs throughout the year. And these represent emissions from residential sources, traffic, power generation industries that are not in Delhi, but are, they are in the surrounding districts. So this is just showing the emission maps on both sides of the, the Yamuna River. And then the crop residue burning. And these are, this is occurring in the states that are upwind of Delhi. So New Delhi is here. The crop residue burning is occurring here in the state of Punjab, which is also the breadbasket for India. So they are the, the top highest uh, food producer, um, uh, producing state in India. So this, the smoke from these fire travel frequently to New Delhi and uh, is a major um, topic of debate among politicians and public during this season. These are not the only sources. Uh, Delhi also frequently uh, experiences dust storms, especially during the pre-monsoon season, April, May, and that also contributes to the poor air quality. So these air pollution episodes in Delhi, they have been getting severe every year. And so you can, you can see here, this is the, an analysis done by a newspaper which is showing the trend in premature mortalities from 2005 to 2006 to 2014-15. So after 2010, there has been a sharp increase in the air pollution related uh, uh, 
premature, uh, sorry, the hospital admissions. So that's what the newspaper started writing. Like leave Delhi is what doctors are prescribing to, to the patients who are facing serious respiratory, respiratory problems because of air pollution in Delhi. When uh, President Obama visited Delhi, so there was a front page article saying that Delhi's polluted air may force Obama to stay indoors. And this is a this is a picture of a cricket match between India and Sri Lanka. And this is before COVID. So when air pollution was so bad that, uh, that the players started vomiting on the field and the players had to wear masks uh, while playing on the field. So it became a very, very serious problem. And the government of India has taken several steps, including setting up measurement networks, air quality forecasting system. And that's where we come into picture, uh, especially in, in this development of the air quality forecasting system. Plus there is an information dissemination website where one can go and get information about observations and uh, the model predictions that is open to both the decision makers and public. So in our system, currently we have a three domain setup where the outermost domain is covering the northern part of the Indian subcontinent at 10 kilometer resolution. Then we zoom over to Delhi and surrounding states um, at two kilometer resolution. And finally, we cover Delhi at 400 meter resolution. So to start with, in the first phase, we developed the system with two domains, and then there was a need to add the third domain, and I'll talk about that later. So this is how our Delhi air quality forecasting system works. Uh, every day we get the GFS meteorological initial and boundary conditions. So in the first phase, we were getting it from the, the, the NOAA website, the normal GFS forecast. But Indian Institute of Tropical Metrology, they are also running their own version of GFS with a simulation of uh, many observations from India. And so we have now replaced it with the IITM GFS uh, meteorological forecast. We get the near real time fire emissions, uh, our NCAR VECM output for chemical boundary conditions, anthropogenic emissions that are pre prepared, and several other data sets. And we also need a previous day forecast to initialize the chemical state of the model. So all this information goes into the warf chem based air quality forecasting system. And we get background initial conditions as well as meteorological and chemical boundary conditions. Now we want to improve uh, these uh, background initial conditions. So what we do is uh, we retrieve near real time uh, MODIS aerosol optical depth retrievals and combine those uh, with the background initial conditions in the GSI based data simulation system. And we improve uh, or correct the aerosol in the initial conditions. This then uh, we use with the meteorological and chemical boundary conditions to produce a 72 hour air quality forecast, which then also serves as the um, initial conditions for the next day, the background initial conditions, and also the um, goes to the information dissemination website. So first to show here, like how the assimilation of MODIS AOD is helping the initialization of WARF cam. Here um, in black, I'm showing the frequency distribution of MODIS AOD. And this is during October, November, 2017, which is when we were testing the system for uh, implementation. And in red, we have the WARF cam forecast. So we have a substantial underestimation of AOD by the model. And after assimilation, we get it very close to the observation as I show in the, in the blue. Then we were looking at, okay, where is this MODIS AOD assimilation is having the maximum impact on surface PM 2.5 and Delhi is here. So this is the, the Punjab state where the crop residue burning is highest. So we see that with the assimilation of MODIS AOD, we were getting the maximum benefit in the source region affected by the crop residue burning but also the, the surface PM 2.5 downwind of these fires. And this is where we wanted to improve our air quality forecast. So we did uh, five experiments to understand the relative importance of various three processes, MODIS AOD assimilation, fire emissions. We know that for the forecast, we don't know how fire emissions are going, into, going to change in the future. So we have to make a persistent fire emission assumption assuming that the fire emissions that we have today will persist over the next three days. So we evaluated uh, the efficacy of that persistent fire emission assumption. And then the aerosol radiation interactions. 
means it's a very polluted region. AOD is very high. So we expect that aerosol radiation interaction will be playing a major role um, in air quality and weather forecast. So we wanted to test that and, and did experiments to, uh, to look at it, its impacts. Um, we, after making the forecast, we need observations for evaluation. Uh, this is the slide showing uh, observation network in Delhi. All these red dots are the measurement stations. For this study, we had observations from 24 stations, but this has now grown to 47 stations. And so we also, uh, this is the, the raw data that we got from the network. So we apply several uh, quality control criteria and, uh, and try to do some uh, quality assurance of the data. So by applying these uh, four quality control criteria, we rejected uh, more than 1500 observations out of uh, more than 23,000 observations, and then use those uh, observations for evaluation. So here uh, I'm showing the improvements in 72 hour average forecast of PM 2.5. Uh, this is the lead time from zero to 72 hours. This is average PM 2.5 averaged over 10 October to 19 November, 2017. So in black, you see the observation. In red, we have warf cam forecast without the assimilation of AOD. In blue, we have the warf cam forecast with the assimilation of AOD plus the aerosol radiation feedback turned on. And this is our best forecast. So we significantly reduce the error in the prediction. We still don't get close, means we still don't reproduce the observations, but I will show that this is of uh, enough accuracy to help the decision makers. If you just assimilate the MODIS AOD and do not allow for aerosol radiation feedback, then you get the green line. So which is showing, highlighting the importance of having these aerosol radiation interaction on more than a month long time scale. And the, the benefits could, are higher when we're looking at day-to-day uh, -day time scale. So here, this is again the same uh, color scheme, but now we are looking at daily average for the first day forecast, second day forecast, and the third day forecast. And here I'm uh, listing the mean bias reduction in day one, day two, and day three forecast. So first thing is that we get a large improvement. Uh, we reduce the mean bias by 70 to 86% um, on different days of the forecast. The second is, um, again, remember the red color is the forecast without assimilation and blue is the forecast with assimilation and aerosol radiation feedback. So you can see that green is without the aerosol radiation feedback, but still assimilating. So for most part, green and blue are overlapping, but when we go to the, the most severe air pollution episodes, that's where aerosol radiation interactions become more important. So you see that there is a large difference between the, the green and the blue lines. Um, so uh, about 75% of the improvement on an average in the forecast came from the assimilation of MODIS AOD uh, with the about 25% due to uh, the interaction of aerosols with radiation. The dotted lines in this figure, they show the forecast corresponding to the persistent fire emission assumption. And you can see that they follow very well the solid lines, which indicating that the persistent fire emission assumption works really well in this area and this is mainly because the burning is dominated by the human activity, which persists over a period of 15 to 20 days. But then we try to see whether these uh, air quality improvements are also translating to the weather forecast. And now here I'm showing daily variation, daily in average, daily average temperature forecast um, in New Delhi um, for the first, second and third day of the forecast. So again, you see that the blue line, which in, assimilates MODIS AOD as well as uh, allows aerosol radiation interaction is the closest to the observations. So we get the highest improvement on the second day of the forecast. And like on days of really high aerosol loading, we are even improving the temperature forecast by more than three to four Kelvin or three to four degrees Celsius um, every day. So we, we feel that we are getting the highest improvement on the second day of the forecast because we refresh the meteorology every day when we launch a new forecast. And so the all the, the advantage that we have accumulated over the in the previous forecast that get refreshed and the model needs some time to, to again accumulate those feedbacks. 
so we get a uh, high highest on the second day followed by the third day and with the least um, uh, improvement on the on the first day but this is still good improvement in the in the temperature forecast so again showing that it's important to have aerosols uh, in the numerical weather predictions especially under heavy aerosol conditions these are the effects on uh, downward reaching uh, solar radiation at the surface and planetary boundary layer height. So we see a decrease of about 100 watts per meter square on average in the SW down and about 500 meters in the PBL. So this AOD assimilation, it's inducing a positive feedback that increases uh, surface PM2.5 concentrations in the model. Then uh, we, uh, so we were improving the accuracy of the air quality forecast, but we were not quite reaching the observations. And this uh, poses a, posed us a challenge. So we decided to go down to 400 meter resolution, but then we had three challenges. First is optimization of high resolution emissions, constraining models initial state with the observation, because GSI assumed that PM 2.5 greater than 150 microgram per meter cube is outlier. And the model runtime, so 400 meter run is very expensive, and 72 hour forecast takes about eight hours. So um, here, just this is the grid uh, information. I'm gonna skip over it uh, in interest of time. We started assimilating surface PM 2.5 from uh, the ground-based network. And here now you see 43 air quality sites compared to 24 that we had previously. And now you can see comparing uh, observation in black with the assimilation in blue and background in red. So there was a large benefit that we were also getting from a simulation of the ground-based observations. Um, another thing was um, emissions. If we are doing a forecast at 400 meter resolution, we need emissions at that resolution. So the Indian Institute of Tropical Meteorology, they developed an emission inventory at 400 meter resolution. And so what, then what we did is um, we uh, upscaled the 400 meter emissions to 10 kilometer and tried to compare the two forecasts. So here in black, we have observation. In blue, we have suffer emissions upscale to 10 kilometer. And in red, we have the emissions at 400 meter. So just by upscaling, uh, we were able to get uh, the forecast accuracy as much as we are getting in 400 meter forecast. So to provide uh, forecast timely, we do the 10 kilometer and two kilometer forecast at first, and then downscale the 400 meter. So the first piece of information to the decision maker comes from the 10 kilometer forecast. And this, um, this evaluation showed us that, uh, that uh, the decision makers can get a good piece of uh, confidence in using 10 kilometer forecast as first piece of information. We also did the forecast evaluation um, looking at different metrics. So if you see green or blue color in this table, it means that the performance of the forecast is excellent to good. So in most cases, uh, the performance was good to excellent. And the these different statistical metrics, they do not change significantly from day one to day three, which means that the performance does not degree, degrade significantly from day one to day three. So how this is helping? Uh, this information is used by the Commission for Air Quality Management in Delhi. And if there is a prediction of polluted air, then they put bans. Uh, like here, this happened in November last year. They shut down school colleges and put a ban on construction activities. When there is a forecast of cleaner air, they, there is a um, phased opening plan. Like uh, when the, the air was cleaner, schools reopened, but the ban on the construction still stayed on. So this information is empowering uh, the decision makers. So these forecasts are available on this website. And uh, this brings to my summary slide. I'll keep it up and uh, take any questions. Thank you. Thanks, Rajesh. Uh, any questions? I don't see anything in the chat either. Uh, I have one. OK, go ahead. Uh, yeah, my, my question is the feedback to meteorology. Is that mm -hmm. through cloud and radiation? Uh, it's only radiation. Uh, so radiation. here. Yeah, here we are using the Gokart chemical mechanism. So mm -hmm. that does not interact with the microphysics. So mm -hmm. the, the only feedback that we have is through radiation. Okay. Uh, along the line, uh, Rajesh, have you looked at the sensitivity to the, to the physics configuration, uh, in particular, like a PBL scheme? Because you emphasize that, you know, the yeah. topography. So 
Um, so, so actually the IITM colleagues, they have done a lot of experiments testing various physics configurations uh, because they are also using a WARF ensemble for fog predictions in, the, in, in Delhi. And so from those ensemble simulations, we identified the configuration that works best for Delhi. So we have not looked at the sensitivity to air quality, but, uh, uh, but we, in terms of weather simulations, we, we went ahead with the best configuration uh, from that mini ensemble they use for the folk predictions. So um, initially uh, the Baulek PBL scheme, which is a good scheme for stable conditions. So we started with that because that was performing the best uh, for winter time. And recently we changed it to y MYNN. MYNN 2.5, and we, we have not seen a significant change in the forecast performance so far. Okay, interesting. Thank you. Uh, I think we have to move on to the next speaker, um, Arzu Rafie Nasa. <laughs> uh, she's going to talk about enhancing flood and flood impact prediction skill through hydrologic uh, data simulation and uh, advanced geospatial analysis methods. Thank you. Can you see my screen? Yeah. So, okay, good. Uh, my name is Arzu, and I'm going to talk today about some of our flood simulation and flood predictions uh, within the Warp Hydro Group. This is a work supported by uh, the bigger, you know, like size Warp Hydro Group, not only the people who have been listed here, but these are the people who have helped with the uh, slides uh, for this meeting. And uh, the War Fighter Group or our group has been in the operational, has been doing operational hydrology forecasting and in particular flood forecasting for years now. Uh, the project that you might know about is the uh, National Water Model, which is producing uh, forecasts for a wide range of applications. And that's why we have, you know, like stream flow and other hydrology components forecasts from a few hours up to a month in advance. And that has been operational from 2016. But we know that there are limitations with the current configurations and the step project is providing a very good opportunity for us to tackle some of those issues and try to resolve them. And there are many things that could be improved, but the three things that I would like to take uh, from, or we would like to take from the step project is to focus first on the uncertainty and errors, which comes from the meteorological forcing. And this is a team tack uh, or teamwork that I would like to, uh, to get, you know, like the inputs from Jenny's group and also, you know, like Ethan's work and implement it uh, within our uh, workflow. The other area that is my own interest uh, and actually, you know, like could improve, you know, like the hydrology forecast accuracy a lot is the data estimation in particular, you know, like hydrologic data estimation and simulating river state information and improving the, the forecast skills. And lastly, we don't want to only improve the model simulations and forecasts. We would like to better disseminate that information into the end user and provide, you know, like meaningful uh, uh, guidance to where, you know, and where the flooding is happening and how much is the depth of the flooding that they could expect. So these are the, the, the things and the research uh, uh, topics that we would like to uh, pursue further during, through the STEP project. Previously, we were working on Colorado as a test case, but recently, you know, like we agreed to, to work on a given, you know, like test case that uh, is an interest to everyone within the group. And we selected, you know, like the flooding test case from Virginia in 2016 and the Rolampico, uh, which we would probably, you know, like do in the other workshops. But this test case is from June of 2016, there was heavy rainfall and there was recorded rainfall during the day of uh, exceeding 200 to 250 millimeter. That produced a very you know, like, uh, heavy flooding, uh, which rise pretty fast and uh, uh, resulted in 23 fatalities and also you know, like damage and destructions up to 1500 uh, roads and bridges over the state. And there was five new record uh, of river stage or class. So the map on the right, actually I borrowed from this paper from Martinez. Uh, the background map has the 24 hour accumulated precipitation from a stage four and the, the red and purple area is showing, you know, like where the heavy rainfall happened. And on the top, you know, like the, the dots, the black dots and the polygons are showing, you know, the, the National Weather Service 
uh, local uh, storm data and reports. And the colored triangles are showing where we have USGS observation, stream flow observations, which the, the color is stating the severity of the flood. So basically, you know, the uh, yellow is when you start to see, you know, like some rise in the flow and when as, as it turns to red and purple, that, that is just severe flooding, which results in inundations of uh, fuel structures or roads. For this event, there was you know, like 20, more than 20 gauges that got flooded and nine of them, those have major flooding and five of those had a record high uh, up to that time. We build our four fighter domain based on those gauges. We wanted to cover you know, like all of them in their contributing area. This is the domain that we ended up with. This is a pretty you know, like densely gauged location. It's a very good uh, test case. We have more than 100 stream flow uh, locations, observation locations, which they report at hourly or sub hourly. And out of those, there are 37 reference locations or reference gauges, meaning that there is no two uh, minimum regulations and reservoirs or lakes above it. From these, 25 of them got flooded. Uh, and I will focus only on few locations in this uh, presentation. Let's look at how the model is doing out of the box, not completely out of the box, but uh, on the right hand side, I have the model simulation so that the red stars in these four plus are showing the observations coming from the USGS. And the black and blue lines are showing the model simulations, the stream flow model simulations forced by ARC in black and WARF in blue. So the ARC stands for the analysis of record for calibration. I have the sum precipitation for the, 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 for the day, June 23rd here. And this is a product put together by NOAA specifically for the calibration of the national world model. It has data over 40 years. Uh, the WARF came from Jenny's group. This is a single run. Uh, it had only one year uh, sorry, one day data. So this is the accumulated precipitation. You can see, you know, like the WARF could, you know, like represent observed data pretty well. There are some mismatches, especially, and we have, you know, like higher intensity in the WARF inputs than what is in the ARC. And you can see, you know, like the downstream effect and differences between the ARC and WARF in the uh, WARF hydro simulations, which resulted, you know, like in different uh, stream flow simulations. For this gauge, for example, the WARF four simulations are higher than what is observed and in other three locations are slightly lower. So this is actually one area that we would like to collaborate with other groups and uh, seek their forcing and uh, feed it into our model and see the impacts downstream locations of it. And this is a separate gauge, you know, which there is this heavy rainfall storm right above it and the ARC was missing this event uh, kind of and now with the wharf uh, simulations we have a better simulations at least in terms of peak but we have double peaks. One area that we would like to work you know like on it is the data estimation and improving the forecast through the observations which comes from these USGS gauges and on the top plot here I have the 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 chain of the model uh, physics within Wharf Hydro, which we get, you know, like a forcing from a forcing engine or from other groups, and then there is LSM. We do move the war horizontally, and at the end part of it, that horizontally routed war either goes into the streams or go into the deep ground water. And that's what we call bucket here because it's a very simple conceptual representation of what happens in the ground water. We pulled those two components out because it's computationally very cheap to run those. So we could actually do ensemble DA and that's, that's the main motivation behind that. So we are actually you know, like simulating a stream flow and updating only the parameters which are impacting these two components and not you know, like updating any of the LSM related parameters. This work is started about three or four years ago to a, a different funded project uh, to NOAA. And uh, James McRae, who left our group, and Moha from Dart Group worked on it extensively for a different test case. Uh, they studied Florence hurricane. For this test case, I am using what is their optimal you know, like configuration. So we are using EAKF for the formal feature. 
there is both prior and posterior inflation to add, you know, like to a spread of the model uh, when it's uh, not enough. We have a very new localization of schemes because the, the one that was in DART is actually impacting based on the radius uh, in all the directions. But for the streams, we wanted to impact and update only the states that are uh, directly above or down a stream of a location. So if, if any of these dots are the observations, we want to impact only the streams that are uh, up a stream or down a stream of it and not, you know, like in the neighboring or adjacent uh, rivers that might not be correlated. We added the parameter noise. So we are actually you know, like adding or perturbing the inflows to the channels uh, and to the groundwater buckets. And we also, you know, like create an ensemble of the parameters through perturbing the channel parameters to create some, you know, like uh, artificial uh, uh, spread. Let's look at just a single hydrograph here and uh, talk about that a little bit before I go to the next slide, which have you know like more examples. On this plot, I am top top panel is showing the stream flow simulations and uh, the the stars or the observed stream flow. When it's green, that means you know it got a simulated red means it's rejected. And the rejected cr criteria for DART is how the spread of the model is and how far that is from the observed uh, values. Uh, the orange color shows the open loop. In this case, in this gauge, the open loop was not too far from what it should be. And the blue is after a simulation. So when we do a simulate for this gauge, we get, you know, like the, the volume of the flow uh, pretty well. Not a lot of improvement in the peak values. And the black is showing, you know, like what will happen if you assimilate and then let it run in the forecast mode. And that is after one hour. So a, a useless data simulation, the black will just uh, relax into the orange color, which here, you know, like we don't see that one. And the RMC values are, you know, like listed here. So you can, you can see, you know, like the open loop has about five, CM, five uh, CMS or MSC. And then after, you know, like doing a simulation that has been reduced to one. And when it goes to forecast, it's slightly above, you know, like one, but still, you know, like a big improvement compared to the open loop. The bottom plot is showing, you know, like the inflation and how hard it's trying to, you know, like the high values is saying, you know, like the inflation is trying to add, you know, like artificially to the spread of the ensemble to be able to capture, you know, like the observations and assimilate those. Let's look at a few other locations. Here, this is a sample that the model did pretty well and the DART and data assimilation couldn't, you know, like improve upon what we already had. And uh, some of the observations got projected. But in this sample, for example, you can see, you know, like that all the observations got assimilated. So the, the green color, and now, you know, like the peak and the volume is represented a lot better than what is in the open loop. But it's still, you know, like some of the observations, sorry, still, you know, like far from, you know, like what it could be uh, an observed. And the last plot here is showing a limitations, you know, in the current configurations where, you know, like it's trying to add the spread, but it's still, you know, like it's not enough to simulate those observations and they get rejected. There are ways to, to mitigate that this problem, either you know, like through changing the configuration in the dart, playing with the parameters that we could, or you know, like adding a spread of the forcings, which I'm hoping you know to get from the Jenny's group through the step project, and that could resolve uh, this issue to some degree. But there is a still, you know, like in the absence of an ensemble forcing or a better forcing, we could still, you know, like play with the parameters from Dart, for example, here. I am changing the localization radius from 100 kilometers to 150 kilometers. So I'm letting it, the observations to impact bigger, you know, like range of the states. And you can see, you know, like for this particular gauge, that change in the localization radius could actually you know, like result in simulating majority of the observations. And now I have a very, you know, like high quality forecast. But we don't want to, you know, like only optimize at a given locations. We want to have, you know, like the setting that works for all the gauges. So that's why, you know, like you look across the domain and pick, you know, what would be the best localization radius, which for this case seems to be, you know, like with the current configuration, 100 to 150 counters. We get, you know, like improvements through DA, uh, 
and then we want to you know like disseminate that information so to to the end user so this is a different piece uh, more on you know like how to uh, how to better you know like represent our model simulations and uh, communicate that information and from our model, there is a variable called ponded water, which is the depth of the water on the routed grid. And here, you know, the grid for my test case is 250 meter by 250 meter. But there is, you know, like need for a higher resolution, even higher uh, resolution than 250 meters. And that's what, you know, like Kevin and Matt is, are working. And it's redistributing that ponded water based on the topography with the assumption that you know, like the water tries to move to the to the locally lower elevation, so it, we could reroute it and redistribute it, and come up with the ponded or the inundation mappings. So, and this is just two, you know, like a screenshots. Um, they did not have enough time to play with this test case, but these are just two screenshots to show you know, like how it works. It will create a two D maps of what is the depth of the water at different locations. In summary, you know, like we we have established that the DA could help us and benefit us, and we want to, you know, like for this test case, optimize our current configurations in the near future, and also, you know, like verify the impact on the longer forecast period, like what Rajesh was showing, uh, go up to, you know, like a day in a, a day in advance. Uh, the focus of a step is up to 36 hours, with a focus on the first 12 hours. So that's what we want to focus on. And then, you know, like get the forcings on all, and preferably ensemble forcings from other groups. Another piece that we are working on the DA side, and Moha is actually doing some experiments right now, is to actually, you know, like bring the information from the long term model simulations and add it and, you know, to, to, to the existing, you know, like information that comes from uh, the current model runs. And uh, hopefully, you know, like that provides a better spread and might mitigate some of the problems that we see. And the last piece is on the inundation mapping. The plots that I showed you is coming from the pluvial inundations and it, it's excluding the rivers. So Kevin and Matt would like to explore, you know, like adding the stream flow, uh, the, basically the channel a stream flow uh, to these inundation maps to provide a better and a more uh, uh, representations of what is happening. I'll stop here to take any questions if there is any. Sorry, I ran over time. Uh, thank you. Uh, thanks for the nice presentation. Uh, do you have any uh, question here? Or in the meantime, I can ask one question. Sure. Um, I guess uh, this, you know, I'm not very familiar with this hydro, you know, like a hydrologic uh, data simulation. Uh, but I guess uh, the model or background uh, might have some, you know, like a significant bias, right? Depending on where you are looking at. Right. So, yeah. So how is, do you actually uh, have, a, have a way to, you know, like a treat the bias correction or how do you deal with that? Uh, no, we actually don't do any bias correction currently on it. Okay. How do you know? Do you have any sense how much it can, uh, you know, like affect the quality of the analysis here? Mm. Not really. Okay. Sorry so, about that. Maybe okay. Dave wanted to. I mean, well, I was just going to say. I mean, we do start with a calibrated model for the most part. So mm. there is there's some differences there than what you might find in a normal free running app atmospheric model where for, and Arisu showed this at the very beginning, a lot of those stations that were forecasting flow at, they were calibration stations as well. So while not all the model bias is removed through the model calibration process, a lot of it is before we get into a forecast mode and it's calibrated based on what Arisu, you know, close to 12 years or so of historical data moving into the forecast part. So these configurations, is, I, this would be considered a calibrated model. We can't calibrate the model everywhere, obviously, because we don't have observations everywhere. Right. But to the degree that we can upstream from uh, certain gauges, it is it is a calibrated model, which addresses some of the background bias issue. Right. Not all of it, but some of it. Makes sense. Thank you. I actually thank Dave for adding that one. And one thing that I wanted to mention that I forgot is that this model is calibrated to the ARC, so the comparison that I was showing with the WARF, it's not fair to the WARF, you know, simulations because the model 
was not calibrated to work basically. Okay, thank you. Uh, any other question? Okay, I think that's it then uh, for the for the session. Uh, thank you, uh, you know, uh, both of the speakers here. And uh, Jenny, you can take it over. Jenny, if you're talking, you're muted. All right, sorry. Yeah, uh, yeah. I'm, I'm just waiting for a little while to make sure the number you know, is uh, correct. Is the, really the number for the people who want to participate in the discussion. So now we have 19 people, 18. <laughs> so, okay. Uh, so we can either uh, break up into two groups, 16. So we can have one group, um, just one group open discussion. Um, I myself tend like to have this one group discussion um, just because I want to, to hear more from all the participants on this very important subject. Although we don't have uh, so many people because uh, this subject is quite specialized, but I really see this is a very, going forward, this is a very important subject, you know, coupled modeling from high impact weather prediction. Uh, so why don't we just have one group just, uh, I will modulate the discussion. Maybe someone, oh, Dave, you have a question? Yeah. Uh, oh, you, no, that's a thumbs up. I was agreeing yeah, with you. Up. <laughs> Do you like to take notes? I can do so. Okay. All Thanks, right. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so the first question, I, I maybe I can copy the question to the. I just put them in the chat. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Sarah. Yeah. What aspects of weather model forecasts are most important to drive hazard models? Of course, I think that depends what kind of hazard you have, but there are some general aspects too. I mean, from our perspective, you know, we, we run into it time and time again. It is it's getting meteorological predictions that are of the appropriate scale for the mm -hmm. hazard we're trying to predict. So mm -hmm. we all can assume that taking climate model data and directly shoving it into a very high resolution hydrologic model is not gonna work. Um, and so there's various forms of downscaling and in a way, a lot of us running regional models of sorts are doing downscaling either implicitly or explicitly uh, mm -hmm. in a lot of ways. So to me, you know, that just becomes a core requirement is, is really, you know, not dismissing, but a directly addressing the critical scale relevant processes for the hazard we're trying to model. Mm -hmm. And for um, hydrology would span a lot of those, but for flooding, it is, you know, very high resolution, very high frequency mm -hmm. precipitation estimates. And it's, it's hard to do flood modeling well without that. Uh, to get all the way to things like inundation mapping, which is ultimately what people are going to respond to. So, yeah, it's really being explicit about scale representation is kind of the general recommendation there. Okay, thank you. I see uh, Ethan. Yeah, I'm sort of going to take an answer our zoo had earlier in the day, and just I wanted to promote that though is that it's it's also the location. Right, you've got to get the intensity of precipitation right, but for hydrology, for transportation modeling, for uh, mudslides, for you know all sorts of applications, you, you to put it all the way through to the next step in the in a numerical modeling chain, you have to have precipitation in the right location too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so car, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, Jenny, I, I think it means, uh, although in my presentation, I showed that air quality, improving air quality forecast has implications for improving weather forecast, mm -hmm. but um, 
getting the weather forecasts right is very important for air quality prediction. So many aspects, especially. So the first is the emissions, the online emissions, like the emissions of dust, emissions of sea salt, emission of chemical compounds from the vegetations. Mm -hmm. All these processes are represented online within the models like WARFCAM, fully coupled models. Mm -hmm. um, so we get the information from the meteorological part of the model, pass it to the chemistry part of the model to do all these emissions, do all the reaction rates um, for all the chemical reactions happening in the atmosphere, aerosol thermodynamics, mixing of chemicals, their deposition. So, so having this coupling and improved weather simulations are very critical for improving the air quality simulations. So as a very first start means we have so many, uh, we, we have made so many advances in the numerical weather predictions where why we are advanced data simulation methods. Even if we can get the Im improved meteorological state from those assimilation projects to initialize our air quality forecast, I, I assume that would lead to significant improvements in the air quality forecasts as well. So from your perspective, what is the major deficiency of our current weather model? So um, um, like uh, when we are doing the, so in I will speak about the air quality forecast that we run at NCAR, mm -hmm. the 48 hour for, forecast. Mm -hmm. We do very well in terms of temperature. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so this is uh, directly taking the information from GFS. Mm -hmm. So no meteorological data simulation for our air quality forecast. Mm -hmm. Then winds are substantially overestimated. Mm -hmm. And so when winds will be overestimated, that can lead to overestimation of natural aerosols like dust and uh, sea salt. So that mm -hmm. is one place where it can lead to, to biases. We also have some uh, discrepancy in the relative humidity simulations, which can mm -hmm. affect uh, which can affect when and how the aerosols are going to attract water in the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. um, so there are there are deficiencies right now, especially from the from the winds and the humidity perspective that mm -hmm. can have important effects on the air quality predictions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's uh, interesting to know. So as you, you can see from Truman's talk, uh, our, estimate, uh, our evaluation of um, MPAS uh, against WARF showed uh, MPAS even had a bigger when to speak. <laughs> so I, I'm, I'm not sure, uh, I'm, I'm not sure if uh, uh, that, uh, like if we have the feedback uh, from the uh, land, uh, variables, for example, uh, the, uh, the 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 ground um, moisture, you know, the land surface moisture. Uh, so, uh, if we have that feedback to the meteorology, I don't know if that will help the wind. You know, we this is really two way, right? This coupling. Yeah. So, from your work, I really see. This uh, couple, uh, this feedback to temperature, that's significant, you know. Yeah. That just surprised me. That's uh, quite significant. But for the land uh, surface model, it's uh, same thing. You know, we should uh, also have some feedback from the land land prediction. Uh, so, like uh, soil moisture. See, I I think that's the most obvious one. That definitely will change the surface. The, uh, moisture, but I don't know if that will uh, also improve the wind. Yeah, all these kind of, you know, uh, two-way coupling and uh, feedback, I think they are actually quite important. Yeah. So just, just along those lines. Well, go ahead. <laughs> okay. So just along those lines with, with soil moisture. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm on a project led by Pedro Jimenez where mm -hmm. we're assimilating um, SMAP, satellite mm -hmm. soil moisture retrievals and USCRN um, ground-based soil moisture observations into WARF. Mm -hmm. you know, we're trying to see, does that improve the predictions of dust and dust storms within WARF mm -hmm. in the Southwestern US? Mm -hmm. So we're, so that's, so if you're, if you're interested in pursuing, you know, bringing in soil moisture, um, 
you know, talk to um, Pedro Jimenez, especially, uh, mm -hmm. kind of loop him into that because we're making some advances there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's good to know. Uh, and you know, actually, uh, in terms of the air quality forecasting, um, it is uh, it has a very strong diurnal variation, uh, which is uh, you know like uh, closely tied to the you know soil moisture and it basically the surface flux, right? So you know based on the soil moisture and you know like at uh, the even heat flux. So then, you know, like, because air quality is basically in the boundary layer, so that, you know, like, mm -hmm. uh, it is directly yeah. affecting the, the boundary layer, it, it's actually forcing to the boundary layer scheme. Mm -hmm. So it is, it is quite, you know, like a, a critical. Mm -hmm. say. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. I tied these two coupling together, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, yeah. is uh, land surface, land atmosphere coupling and, uh, and you know, the, uh, atmosphere and the quality, uh, uh, chemistry properly. I think they are all related, actually. And you know, like uh, the aerosol. Uh, so mm -hmm. you asked about the in Rajesh's uh, talk. You asked mm -hmm. about the the feedback, you know, from mm -hmm. the aerosol uh, to the the clouds. You know, uh, I think you know at least uh, recently I found that the you know the the aerosols are uh, playing a pretty critical role in the cloud analysis. So mm -hmm. you know, like uh, it. Uh, the, it can uh, greatly improve the, the cloud forecasting and analysis and forecasting. So I think in that sense, it's, it's quite important to kind of couple this, like a real online couple, you know, mm -hmm. like a, between the aerosol and microphysics as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I just want to, yeah, just want to say that uh, this, if the effect of aerosols on numerical weather prediction it strongly depends on uh, how much aerosol load we have in the atmosphere. So if we are going to do experiments, say, for example, over the US in the absence of wildfires, we may not see much impact of aerosols on the, on the temperature predictions. Mm -hmm. So I, I did a preliminary analysis of how the, the bias in temperature forecast from both the GFS as well as our warf camp forecast, where we substantially underestimate aerosols during wildfires due mm -hmm. to errors in the fire emissions. So mm -hmm. I was looking at the relationship between MODIS AOD and, and the error in the temperature forecast, mm -hmm. and I found a strong positive relation. Mm -hmm. So as the AOD increases, we start to see a large growth of error in the temperature predictions from both GFS and warf camp. And mm -hmm. The AOD value of about 0 0.5 to 0 0.6 is the threshold above which aerosols start to have and start to have uh, a significant impact on the weather forecast. So this is something I think this is um, we, we I, I still need to do more detailed analysis mm. of when and where this is happening, how frequently mm. it is happening, because that type of information is very important to make a decision of mm. whether or not we want to have interactive aerosols in numerical weather predictions. Mm -hmm. Just a quick, you know, like addition to that. So, you know, like a, from the, the NWP perspective, you know, the you know, cloudy condition is, is really hard. You know, it's very challenging um, because, you know, like even the satellite retrievals, you know, a lot of data except radar, <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. they, uh, you know, like a, treat the data, you know, the cloudy, uh, in the cloudy case, they treated most of the data as a missing, you know, and even AOD, you know, they are mostly missing, you know, in the big cloud, you know. So, you know, data simulation cannot be really uh, done, you know, very well, and, you know, like uh, with, with the lack of um, huge data set, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I guess, you know, like uh, in terms of the, the coupling inside the, mo the model mm -hmm. uh, can, you know, play a bigger role in this sense. Because mm -hmm. we don't have, you know, much observed information in the cloudy uh, conditions, so. Yes. Okay, any other questions? Uh, any comment for the question one? Well, I think uh, those comments are really, really important. And uh, uh, so um, maybe uh, for the sake of uh, time, we can maybe uh, go to the second question. I think that is the important 
how we should, uh, um, what are the opportunities for enhancing the coupled modeling research across and through collaboration between weather and uh, hazard modelers. Uh, yeah, I want to hear lots of good ideas. I think if we can organize uh, some kind of group, even, you know, start from there. Uh, so the, in the future, that may be increase the possibility we go out to get fun funding. For this I have a question mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, to you guys, actually, because I'm not a uh, part of, I'm not, uh, you know, in the in the uh, step program here. Mm -hmm. uh, are you guys interested in this uh, couple system, couple DA, couple modeling system uh, for the regional applications? Because I mean, you know, like uh, in the NCAR strategic plan, as far as I understood, you know, like uh, I was actually encouraged to go, I mean, wait and see, <laughs> or, you know, go through the SEMA project, right? Mm -hmm. Which is going to be uh, part of the CSM, meaning that the global, you know, the modeling yeah, yeah. system. Mm -hmm. But I don't know what the step is actually shooting for uh, in terms of the, mo the modeling tool or the system. For the research, the main tool I'm talking about. So, are you yeah, guys are I, going to focus on the regional system, or are you okay? I mean, open to like a, the the global uh, coupled system that is already being built. Well, that coupled system doesn't have the coupling we want, right? Like uh, it's uh, ocean coupling. That's not what we want. I mean, it, it's changed. It, it improved large scale background, but doesn't help. Uh, for the uh, problem we are having now. So, um, and uh, ice, the ice coupling, uh, those are fo most focused on climate uh, scale. So uh, I, I feel that CMA uh, is currently still have a lot of focus on the global and the climate scale. Uh, so um, maybe I'm wrong, um, Glenn. So I'm just trying, um, I hope through this workshop, we can, you know, gather some ideas, uh, which I, I, I hope this SEMA also pay attention to, uh, to the high impact weather prediction, you know, down to the regional and the local scale. So Glenn, do you have any comment on that? Uh, I'll just make a very brief comment that I think where you'll get the most value from having a fully coupled modeling system is through data simulation because the the ability to get the having the, the full representation of the uncertainty in the background earth system will mm -hmm. have uh, structures that are valuable for the data simulation observations to be uh, fully utilized and you can use a broader suite of observations that aren't necessarily specifically for just the atmosphere for example. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so there'll be ways to, to get more value out of those observations. But where that benefit will probably come in is more in like global continuously cycle data simulation uh, as an initial uh, initialization for high resolution uh, atmospheric short term weather prediction. So you probably won't want to run all those systems for a very short term forecast of just an atmospheric phenomena because then it's going to be dominated by the dynamics of the atmosphere for like, you know, zero to six hour forecast of high impact weather, but you may still want to benefit, may still benefit from having all those coupled systems in your uh, background analysis system to where you're really able to leverage the, the full suite of, of information. That would be my initial thinking on that. Well, um, yeah, I understand what you're saying, but for these, uh, like the coupling we are talking about, uh, for example, land atmosphere, uh, full coupling, including through data simulation. Okay, not just coupling through the land uh, surface model, you know, through data simulation, two-way interaction. And this is still kind of a new research, right? So uh, we, there is no need to run a global model to do research. Uh, but of course, in the future, this will be up, applied uh, to the global model, uh, but we will start from still from, from regional model, either WORF or and has, but currently most possibly maybe still work to get the science done. Sure, 
I, mm. I'm not going to argue that there isn't still plenty to be done with mm. standalone models, but I think that the sort of interest, at least at a, at a center and community uh, level right now is more towards the, the sort of fully coupled uh, or system modeling. Mm -hmm. I, so I just want to. When you say fully coupled, you mean all different coupling, you know, uh, coupled with ice, with ocean, with the uh, chemistry, with uh, land. That's what you mean, fully coupled, right? Right. So I think that the bridging between weather and climate, for uh -huh. example, that uh -huh. there's there's a great deal of interest in that space uh -huh. right now, uh -huh. and so that's probably where a lot of the energy and investment is gonna go is mm -hmm. towards meeting that sort of meeting space. Mm -hmm. um, so okay. yeah, that's where I think, and, and it, as you get into longer time scales, the coupling becomes more critical because the time scales, uh, for instance, ocean and land and, and mm -hmm. ice, yeah. uh, those, those systems evolve more slowly than the atmosphere. Yeah, that's right. But those are not important for our short-term prediction. Uh, so depends, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I think you can, you know, you can come up with examples uh, for like within the central U.S. where sometimes with very weak forcing, you can have um, a, a previous storm that comes through. It leaves it rains in certain area of, across the plains, and then you end up with basically an outflow boundary that's tied to where that, that anchors on where the, the rain boundary was mm -hmm. from the previous day because you have more latent heat flux than, than mm -hmm. sensible. So you end up with a thermal boundary and a moisture boundary, and sometimes another storm will come across that boundary the next day and we'll, we'll tap into it. So there can be a uh, day-to-day -day sensitivity that's impacted by you know, the, the behavior of, of the vegetation on the surface and, and uh, direct surface inundation. So I think, uh, you know, there, there can be feedbacks between the land. Mm -hmm. uh, you could also, you know, when you look at hurricane prediction, there's a considerable amount of uh, constraints on the, on the flux of, mm -hmm. uh, of, of heat and moisture from the ocean surface. And so if you don't capture the, uh, the energy exchange between the ocean and the atmosphere, you're gonna have a, a suboptimal forecast. So uh, you, you can find examples where coupling is important in certain uh, high impact weather. Okay, thank you. So uh, Ethan, are you going for I think it? Rajesh had a question. Uh, Rajesh, yeah. yeah. Mm. No, I just, just wanted to make a comment that I means for, for understanding what opportunities exist for cross lab collaboration across NCARS, we need to identify what problems we are trying to address um, in this perspective. The collaboration could be could look very different, means depending on what problem uh, we are targeting. Say, for example, if we are, if we look at the wildfire situation, means uh, there could be a low hanging fruit for cross lab collaboration between MQ, DRAL, and ACOM uh, in terms of coupling the fire behavior models with the atmospheric chemistry models so that we uh, we have a tool to not only simulate the evolution and progression of a wildfire, but at the same time also characterize its impact on air quality. So I think having a, a session or maybe identifying those topics uh, um, that can lead to some some uh, means identifying those low hanging fruits that can be reaped with, uh, with the available funding opportunities, uh, we, should, we should discuss those. Thanks. So Ethan? Yeah, and I sort of echoing on Rajesh's, sorry, I've really moved around. I was trying to find Rajesh. Um, <laughs> there's the particular things like uh, wildfire, but then also the machine learning approaches that have come up a few times in here could benefit with some cross lab collaboration with Sizzle. Um, I, but, Coming back to the global modeling and coupled modeling question, um, I think this is sort of a big question that we have to come around to as a community and decide if we are willing to run global models when what we really want to do is simulate a region that's a few hundred kilometers on a side. Um, and it, it, part of it is just potentially a, a mental shift within our community. If running the global model doesn't cost you anything and it doesn't hurt your simulations, um, 
And it means you can now use the exact same modeling system so we can all work together on a single modeling system. There's potentially a lot of benefit there. Um, at the same time, if we can <clears throat> very clearly enunciate the reasons why you need a regional model. So for example, you wanna run a, a set of experiments that all have exactly the same boundary conditions. Um, that's something that we need to make sure gets propagated up because my impression is that the SEMA development so far is um, ha has zero focus on regional modeling, basically. I, I realize that it may come out in the future, but talking with people there, it, it seems like that is you know the tenth priority on the list. Yeah, I I feel that same thing, uh, but I think um, uh, to get associated with the SEMA. Uh, for us, um, the easiest thing is to uh, first to begin to use uh, um, uh, MPAS, you know, because MPAS is part of SEMA. Now, if we begin to uh, shift from WORF to MPAS, uh, then when a lot of people begin to use MPAS, even doesn't matter you use it to, uh, for the whole globe, globe or just, you know, regional for a limited area, but you are using MPAS, that is part of a CIMA. So I think CIMA will pay attention to the region of, uh, you know, prediction, the regional part, yeah. So it's kind of also, I feel it depends on us. Uh, mm -hmm. I have something to add here. <laughs> Uh, so I just saw a glance, uh, you know, comment on, you know, like a regional CSM, uh, which sounds great to me. Um, I think, you know, through the step program or anything, you know, I guess we can contribute to kind of, a, you know, uh, pushing this uh, direction a little more, right? If, if, if uh, there's enough interest in the regional application. I mean, you know, like I have no problem, you know, like a waiting for SEMA <laughs> to kind of, uh, you know, get the, uh, the, you know, uh, the couples, you know, global couple system uh, is a, like a forcing, right, right, to drive the regional uh, model modeling system. But if if there's enough interest in, you know, like uh, developing the regional couple system uh, at the same time, I think it's definitely doable, right? I mean, you know, like uh, Jenny, you mentioned that uh, the MPAS and, you know, I agree, and we do have the regional MPAS and at least, you know, like uh, within CSM, the DART system is already supporting the regional MPAS, so it's already there. But mm -hmm. you know, I guess uh, if you are thinking about the cycling, you know, the, with the data simulation, then I guess there might be some, uh, at least some modification or some sort of a special development, uh, particularly for the regional uh, stuff. Because I don't think it's enough to have the regional MPAS and the the regional DART, you know, MPAS DART system here. Mm -hmm. I'm probably not uh, right, but uh, in terms of the coupling system, right? I mean, everything else would be global, but just yeah. having the atmospheric model as a yeah. regional, I don't think that's going to work right away, right? Mm -hmm. But what I'm saying is it, it is doable. I'm just saying if there's any uh, enough uh, interest or, you know, like a, a motivation <laughs> out yeah. there within NCAR or cross lab. Right. Yeah. From at the present, I think CIMA, uh, the weak part of CIMA is data assimilation. And uh, of course, there is no regional application even mentioned. Uh, so, so, Glenn, how do you see these two parts will be more emphasized in CIMA? Data assimilation and regional application. Right. Um... In the short term, I don't think they will be easily addressable. So mm -hmm. I think, um, you know, SEMA is really, it's about um, just the atmospheric dynamic cores, physics, mm -hmm. chemistry, um, and uh, geospace applications. And so mm -hmm. it's a very narrow focus that really is SEMA, if you will. It's meant to work with a, to operate within an Earth system model, but it's not, that's beyond the scope of what SEMA does. And so, uh, so where does data simulation fit in? Well, data simulation is more in trying to get to Earth system predictability. And so to do Earth system predictability, you need to be able to do prediction. And to do prediction, you have to do data simulation. Mm -hmm. And data simulation will then uh, 
confront climate models and climate model um, physics against uh, actual observations, which they've historically not worried about. Mm. And so I think they're going to learn a lot by by actually comparing their model simulations more directly to observations uh, in that it'll it'll be to their benefit. Regarding regional, so MPAS has the capability to run regional and there's some other um, regional components that potentially could be brought together in a, in a coupled system. So it there you basically have to figure out how to take the mediator and work with uh, purely regional capable uh, mm -hmm. systems. So there's a reason to believe that can be done, mm -hmm. um, but currently that you know the approach to do that is is challenging. Within CSM, you can do data simulation. Uh, it has been done with Dart, uh, but mostly just with with uh, two component models. So it's been done with the ocean model POP, and it's mm -hmm. been done with uh, CAM, the atmosphere model within it. But I don't, I'm not aware of other. There may be some CI stuff that's been done more recently, but there, there's been relatively little in terms of uh, DA with modeling systems embedded within CSM and especially doing multiple mm. component models simultaneously. So there's a lot of work to be done uh, in that space. And the whole idea of whether you do DA on individual components or you do DA where you can go cross components, so fully coupled DA, mm. that's still kind of an open question as to what the right approach is. But the bigger challenge is that once you've updated each of those individual modeling states, you don't want to have um, uh, imbalanced fluxes, basically. So when you start to do the integration, that there's these, you know, feedback effects that cause resonance and bad model behavior. A lot of that sort of smooth transition from analysis to forecast that we spend so much time trying to figure out how to do with convective uh, mm -hmm. data simulation. It's mm -hmm. it's all the more hard, difficult when you try to do that in a couple modeling environment because the the resonance effects can actually be worse. Because mm -hmm. uh, then you, you may blow up the mediator in trying to go back and forth. So um, there's a lot of challenges to be overcome and a lot of work, and it's going to require time, energy, and effort. And when you're in a fixed funding environment, the question is, is what are we not going to be doing? So <laughs> if for everything you want to add on is like, we really need an investment in X, Y, and Z. Okay, yeah. I need A, B, and C that we're going to stop doing. And so that we could free up funding to be able yeah, to do things. So the goal here is to, to make sure that step is the thing that more resources comes to, as opposed to being the thing that gets cut. And so that's why I'm saying it's useful to be uh, integrated in these, in where the center is trying to go, as mm -hmm. opposed to kind of standing on the side and going, yeah, I think we're good where we are, because then you kind of put yourself out there on the chopping block of somebody who's not on board with where the center is trying to go. So that's that's my, I guess, directorate level advice that I'll offer the group. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Uh, so because uh, we're already exceeding the time a little bit, um, but um, you know, there are several things uh, we can emphasize in the future other than what we are doing. You know, we always need to think about the future. Uh, so, but I think coupled modeling is something in my mind, I think that is so important for high in, in pair weather prediction. So that also can tie it uh, together with the other lab, you know, with uh, somehow in the future, maybe with the SIMA. So I think that is something we want to begin to uh, think about and maybe organize a group, you know, to have some, um, collaboration. I don't know what you guys think about this. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, yeah, Jenny, I think, you know, we've been talking about different ways to integrate for a while. Um, mm. You know, some of it's domain, some of it's the forecast problem, mm -hmm. right? Um, and that leads to, to joint case studies and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, I'll just say anecdotally, you know, while uh, a couple of the earlier talks today mm -hmm. were going on, you know, there was some very obvious linkages in some of the lower atmospheric data simulation results that were presented mm -hmm. to, to more to bridging that over to the land data mm -hmm. assimilation part as well, you know, and so maybe we can't at this time say, 
we're going to go grab this new version of CESM running the cloud resolving scales over the globe and do joint DA. Maybe just we're not there, right? It's not ready. No, we are not there. But sounds like we could start putting together different pieces of this chain, even if the whole chain can't be put together right now. Mm -hmm. So it, I would just, you know, again, reemphasize like working with you guys on settling on a case study where we can pipe the precipitation uncertainties through the hydrology is great. Working with Tammy's group on land DA and lower atmospheric DA is a very nice, natural, another couple of links of the chain that can come together. Um, you know, same with what Ethan and Sarah are doing with, mm -hmm. with their projects and looking at the impacts of those on hydrologic predictability and mm -hmm. so on. I'm biased, right? I'm talking about the things that our group could do, reaching out to others, but I think mm -hmm. everybody could probably see those connections. And again, maybe it's not the entire chain right now, but if everybody finds a way to link in with at least one or two other groups, this annual cycle of funding we keep building out from that, it might be a more realistic way to get mm -hmm. to the grand vision, um, mm -hmm. lacking a big resource mm -hmm. increment, which doesn't appear to be eminent, mm -hmm. based on what Glenn's saying here. So, yeah. Yeah. But mm -hmm. I think people have to be proactive, too. Yeah, yeah. Um, there probably are some really interesting pieces to look at in terms of how the, the global system affects the very local short-term forecast. How does... The, the snow in the Arctic or the sea ice extent affect blocking patterns and therefore affect the very, very localized convective precipitation events um, in terms of the sort of formation, propagation, and uh, you know, sort of uh, upscale growth. Mm -hmm. I, I, obviously, things like tropical easterly waves impacting hurricanes, um, the, there's a lot of pieces where it it is the global system. And I think Glenn made some good comments about how does your, your, your maybe you were talking about something else actually, but how the, the boundary mm -hmm. interacts. And if you're forcing a fixed boundary, you're imposing some things back into the domain that you might not want to do. Um, mm -hmm. Whereas if you have a fully coupled global model mm -hmm. and the, the other 90% of the world that you're not simulating takes 1% of the computational cost, that's fine, right? It, and that might even get you something in terms of flexibility on the boundary conditions, but we don't know that. Um, mm -hmm. and that's that's the kind of interesting study that I think is, is sort of what, yeah, I, I don't want to put words in your mouth again, Glenn, but the, that's the kind of thing that helps connect us back to the larger strategic vision at NCAR that I think would probably be beneficial. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah, I think that's a fair uh, mm -hmm. assessment. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, through step because uh, step emphasis in couple model, coupled modeling is uh, on the hydrological side, so we don't have the air quality part, of course. Uh, so for the hydrological and atmosphere um, coupling, then we started to work on like. They've said start from simple, something simple, work on the US case. Maybe next year we are going to work on a Relamco uh, case in the South America. Uh, so from there, probably we are going to try to do the couple data simulation. You know, that is the next step. Uh, but uh, currently we don't have uh, the chemistry uh, in step. So, um, uh, of course, if uh, there is the increased funding, we want to <laughs> maybe include uh, the people who, you know, does air quality wildfire. I think that's important for high impact weather uh, study. Uh, so do you like Rajesh, you have any um, suggestion how we can right now without the, uh, you know, uh, funding then how we can get more connected? Yeah, I mean, like, so one of the things that we are looking together in the aftermath of Marshall Fire is, mm -hmm. uh, as, I, as I was saying in the, in the breakout group the other day, that mm -hmm. with the state of the science capabilities in atmospheric chemistry air quality modeling, mm -hmm. our models are not able to characterize the air quality impacts of the wildfire. So mm -hmm. we need this coupling between 
the fire behavior model, whether it is coffee or war fire, mm -hmm. and the chemistry model where the fire behavior model provides rapidly varying emission information to the air quality model. So mm -hmm. this is this is something that we are thinking. Uh, we do have a um, direct proposal mm -hmm. submitted on this topic, coupling of war fire with war chem. Mm -hmm. if, if that goes through means that could become one avenue mm -hmm. for connecting it by one to, to find opportunities where we can go to seek funding for this type of research. Mm -hmm. Yeah, another uh, area you can probably uh, collaborate with the uh, MQ, like uh, Zhou Yang's work, yeah. uh, you know, uh, like uh, through data mm -hmm. simulation, atmospheric data simulation. Yeah. Uh, so that is also uh, a, a natural connection with your work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, okay, so it's 2.22. Are there any other suggestions or questions or comments? So uh, if no, then I think we are done with this uh, discussion session. Then um, I, in the agenda, I originally planned to have a report back, but now I changed my mind um, because there are not many people um, are, uh, here right now. Uh, so how about each of uh, the discussion leads just summarize some uh, main points? You know, for the session, for the discussion group, you 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 led and send uh, the summary to me. Uh, is that okay, or you still want to have some kind of a report back right now? I'm wondering, Jenny, if maybe the best thing might not be. I mean, so it seemed like in most of the breakouts, somebody was taking notes. Mm -hmm. If um we give people an opportunity to sort of write up those notes and then we circulate them. And then at a future step meeting, maybe we go over some of those. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. That's, I think that's yeah, we're yeah. two full mm -hmm. days here and um, ah, yeah. <laughs> maybe we're not going to have much more brilliance being said in the next 10, 20 minutes. Yeah. And, and I will just say, I could flash up my notes. Yeah. They are two pages of very, uh, you know, fragmented sentences and ideas, which probably could be well, much better articulated with a little bit of time. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> you are going to go away, forget about it. Then, uh, next. Well, you're going to have to crack the mask uh, for here. Three months later, then. Our, our notes or maybe, so, maybe shorter we do an, another follow-up but just make sure that everybody gets a some coherent summaries of the breakout yeah, yeah, sessions yeah. written up yes submitted to you and then we can go through a discussion or something oh yeah yeah maybe your uh, your, your suggestion the, the other suggestion is good maybe i find a time on the calendar and then we meet shortly like you know like a half hour or one hour uh, so next week, probably, uh, see if I am lucky, I can find a time for everybody. If I can, maybe we should have a, a brief meeting and have a report of that. OK?